And here he comes again now to bowl to Mikey Matif in a John Sunday. He plays that one out towards cover point. They're going for a single here. What do you mean? Was he's going to have to hurry the throw from Diego? That's the start there. Was he run out without scoring? Of course he was run out without scoring, Tony. You're well, that's what I just said, Bill. Was he out, you stupid awesome? What do you mean, was he out, Tony? Look at the f***ing replay. Hey guys, welcome back to the Leading Edge Cricket Podcast. Episode 5 is here, and as always, it's been a packed week in the world of cricket. And today, we are going to get stuck into the latest news in world cricket, starting with the New Zealand-England second one-day international review. Mark Wood is on the injury bench again. Mornay Morkel, it's retirement time. There's county championship signings. There's plenty of players moving into Durham and Hampshire, not just players. We're talking top-class players. There's more white ball controversy. The Plunkett Shield's about to get up and running again. South Africa, Australia is in the running again. There's England test news. There's the Lions. There's massive news at the top of the T20 and one-day rankings, guys. It is all going on, and this is the place to check it out. I am Rob, one half of the Leading Edge Cricket Podcast, and I'm joined today, as always, by my co-host, Rich. Hey, Rob, how's it going, buddy? We are great. Now, every time we touch base, there's always something great going on in the life of Rich. And now let me give an example. From a couple of episodes ago, Rich was there and he was going, sorry, there's been a delay coming out. I've been in (laughs) Philadelphia watching the Super Bowl. Then last week... Not tipping over cars. Exactly. And then last week, it was what's going on in the life of Rich. He's bought new bowling boots that have turned out to be pink and have his initials (laughs) on the side. Now... The big question on everyone's lips is, what is going on this week, Rich? Uh, absolutely nothing, pal. It's a quiet one this week, bit of DIY. And it's snowing. There you go. Everyone in, in England is obsessed with snow. Went to get some bread last night and there's like about four loaves left in the supermarket. So everyone's panicked by him because we've had two days of snow. We can't cope. I kid you not, I had dinner with an Irish guy tonight who told me in Ireland they have run out of bread. 100%. <laughs> It'll probably be our fault. <laughs> so. It probably is. But before we get into the cricket news, I want to touch on a new section for the podcast, and it's called Club Cricketers Corner. And one of the big ideas around the podcast is that we want to create this listener community and give you guys the opportunity to have cricketing stories read out either on air or through a website that we're working on coming up. So if you have any exceptional cricketing stories club cricket watching cricket drinking cricket whatever it might be send an email to the leading edge podcast at gmail.com and we will make sure we get you on the air now to start this story today this is a this is a corker and i don't think i've ever seen something like this before this made the headlines in september 2017 a cricket club at the center of a fair play row in the welsh league have been relegated after winning the league which is just Absolutely nuts. Mm -hmm. Carrow Cricket Club declared on 18 for 1 against title rivals Cresley. I may be butchering a few of these Welsh names. Makes a change usually me doing the butchering of names. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, he hit that like he can wield a knife with some names. Um, Mm -hmm. But what is amazing about this is they were 21 points clear at the top of the table going into the final game of the season. 20 points for a win and then there's bonus points on top. Now, what the captain did, at 18 for 1, they declared, which meant the opposition, if they won, could not get enough bonus points to win the game. Now, what ended up happening, there was massive uproar over social media. Piers Morgan even got involved sending out a few tweets. You know, it has got real when Piers Morgan is on the bandwagon. And it went all the way to a disciplinary. And Caro, who started started the game 21 points clear, won the league but in fact got relegated from the division and the second team relegated from the division below with that. What makes an even more interesting twist between these two local rivals is that the National Village competition in England has around 300 teams. Chances of playing against this team again would be pretty slim the next season, you would think. You think wrong. Actually, the National Village Cup first round competition has the team that got relegated against the incumbent team that came second in the previous season. Absolutely incredible playing in the first round of the National Village competition. I, what can you say, buddy? What can you say? I mean, first off, I hope they get smashed. <laughs> Whatever they, I forget the name of the team that did the, the declaration, but you know, let's hope they get smashed. Exactly. Is that it, fair? That is that is fair. That's it's really. 
poor, poor behaviour. But incredibly, the club was fined three hundred dollars or three hundred quid. Sorry, whoa, three, whoa, whoa. get quid. back! <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing with these dollars? What are you doing with the dollars? <laughs> Paper money, get it back. Yes, yeah, monopoly money. And the other thing was the team captain had also been told he is banned from the starting of the two thousand eighteen season. Oh dear, you... I've got a couple of things on this one, buddy. If, if you don't mind, Go first off, obviously from a cricketing point of view, and you know, in the spirit of the game, sort of thing. It's pretty weak, isn't it? You know, doing this. Take on the off boat. Take him on. Have a game. Win it outright. Don't be messing about. Um, and also, it's the last game of the season. You know, it's a long old winter over here. As, as, as I'm looking out the window at snow settling on cars, it's a long old time when you're not playing cricket. You only get a chance to play, what is it? You know, if we don't get any rain, we get 18 games in a season. Go and enjoy a last game of cricket. Go and enjoy in the sun. You know, then win that trophy. Have a few beers. Have a few more beers. And then one or two more after that. And celebrate your win. Um, but the other thing as well is it's all well and good kind of the club getting, getting it in the net. But when I first saw this story, there was nothing in the league to say that this was wrong. So spirit of the game, yeah. But the league has created this problem by not having anything written in there. Um, so them actually deciding to relegate this team, it, it's a little bit harsh, I suppose, from that point of view, because they were playing within the law, whereas it wasn't necessarily in the spirit. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, actually. It is within the laws of the game. There's nothing that says they can't do this. But the spirit of cricket is kind of a, a big thing within the cricket community, and you don't expect it. But it, the question would be, what would be an appropriate punishment? I, I, I don't know. I don't know if relegation is the right thing. It's the wrong thing. Rich thinks this should uh, go down a couple of divisions by this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember saying that. <laughs> Edit it in now. Plagiarism. Uh, it, it's a strange one. I assume the second team have been relegated because they were just in successive divisions, so you can't have the first and the twos together. So that's correct. That's just an admin thing. I don't think they've punished the second team, but it's, it's a strange one, isn't it? But you know, it's <laughs> I don't know. I don't really care that much. <laughs> I find it quite poor that they've done it, but um, from the league's reaction, I think they've probably had a bit of adverse publicity, so they've decided they need to make a make a statement. You know, as it got national news. And, yeah. and, and I hope it's going to be the first and last mention of Piers Morgan as well. I don't want that twat mentioned on this podcast anymore. <laughs> Shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> now, if we talk about Piers Morgan, we've got to talk oh, about I the said time first that Brett last. Lee bounced him. Oh, that was quite funny. Yeah, that was quite funny. Mm. Excellent. And there yeah. we go. That is Cricket Corner for today then, guys. Remember, the Leading Edge podcast at gmail.com. Let us know your awesome cricket stories from over the years. There's more than enough that we can reel off, but we really want to bring you guys into this podcast as much as we can. And before we go any further, boom, cricket news. Right, Ben Stokes on his return. Man of the match in his second game back for England against New Zealand yesterday. Um, Stokes, he had a bit of a game, didn't he? He certainly earned his, uh, earned his subs, subs money on this one. Picked up two wickets, key in two runouts, then hit an unbeaten 63 off 74. Useful. Um, just going through the game, New Zealand batted first uh, and were bowled out. Um, well, partly bowled out, we should say. Um, bowled by England, 223 with four balls remaining. Uh, Guptal, this was a strange one, Rob. Um, 50 off 87 balls from Guptal. That yeah. does not sound like Guptal. So you'll be able to tell me a bit more about this game because you will have obviously been able to watch it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, star man yet again, though, our favourite, Mitch Santner. Uh, brilliant 63 knots out off uh, 52 balls to, to help set the modest target. Um, with the ball, as I mentioned, Stokes, two for 42 off his eight, or off eight. Chris Wokes, also two for 42 off 7.4. And Moeen Ali, who I said needs to up his game a bit, he took a very economical two for 33 off his 10 overs. Um, that's only six wickets, isn't it? That is only is, six it, wickets. Right? Where did the other wickets come from? Well... Funny you should ask. Um, runouts, mate. Four runouts. I've, I've, I can't remember the last time that's happened. That's pretty impressive. After England had a pretty shoddy uh, fielding performance in the first ODI, to come back with four wickets from runouts, good fielding, good catches, then that's solid. So, mm. uh, in reply, anyway, uh, England, short work of the total. Thanks to uh, opener Johnny Bear, so 37. Bit of a start, bit like what uh, Jason Roy did in the first ODI. Um, runner ball 62 for skipper Owen Morgan as well as an unbeaten knot from a Josh Butler 36 of 20 and as I mentioned Ben Stokes is 63 knots out so that's one all uh, and we're going into the third ODI on Saturday beautiful beautiful game of cricket great for England to see them come back so strong after losing in the first one day international and I think England set the pace in this game straight from the off getting Colin Munro early again 
is a really big shout. And obviously Mark Chapman came in at three. No Kane Williamson for the second one day international. That made a big difference. So Wokes did the damage up front. He was two for two off two overs at one point. Really setting a marker down. But the the England intensity around what they were doing was shifted up another notch from where they were in the first one day international. This is the England that we saw in Australia. They were it's a complete performance. Solid by the bowlers. The spinners bowled well. The seamers were on point economical, taking wickets, incredible and electric in the field. And Ben Stokes, what a performance. Two wickets, two run-outs, and 63 not out to take them home. This is the game that Ben Stokes would have been... He said he was emotional after the game. This is the game that he was really, really hoping he could have coming back into the England setup. And as a supporter of England, it's bloody awesome to see the fact that it means so much to him. But being in a, a strong electric team where you're on top... It kind of takes the pressure out of him to create something out of the norm, if that makes sense. You know, when a guy mm. comes into the ashes and it's a it's a cauldron and it's hard, it's really hard to make and make an impact. Whereas Stokes here could just go about his business, um, in in the midst of England playing so well, and he had plenty of time with the bat to get himself in, get a decent knock. Doesn't have to go in and leather the ball from ball one, which his reputation precedes him. And I think sometimes he tries to play up to that reputation. But he was everything that England have been missing for a little while in this. And yeah. it's, it's great to see him back with that sort of performance. I absolutely echo those comments, mate. It really is great to see him back. You know, it's his second game back, isn't it? Um, really, really impressive. And it was I'm not surprised that he was a little bit emotional after the game. You know, he's been through a hell of a lot in the last six months or so. Um, and it's still ahead of him, you know. Although he's done this, you know, had this performance, he's got a court case hanging over his head on the 12th of March. Um, you know, just a, you know, a week or so away, a couple of weeks away. So that's still there. He doesn't have to return to England for that, as we as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago. But it's still there. It's still in the back of the mind. So uh, doubly impressive performance when you consider that there's still uh, still a, a case to answer in yeah. the uh, criminal proceedings with uh, with Stokesy. No, it's, it's superb. The New Zealand Indians w- was a funny one. It definitely was a funny one. Guppy really had to dig in at the start. Normally, he'll be quite Guppy. free-flowing. And Brendan McCollum Guppy. was kind of the, the catalyst to this New Zealand team years ago. And his theory was, I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to get a start by being aggressive. And then I will consolidate in the middle of the innings. Whereas a lot of teams play the other way. They consolidate and then go. And Guppy had mm. to go the other way this time. Munro was out, Chappers was out early, Ross Taylor got run out early. And the other thing was, it looked a hard wicket to bat on when England were bowling so well. That's That goes to show how well the England boys bowled. And Mitchie Santner, 63, that's actually his first one-day 50 ever. Um, so credit to him. He's having a bit of a run for himself with the bat at the moment. He'll, he'll ride home to his grandkids when he's older and tell them about the time he got a one-day 50 at a guess. Um, but well, when... this is the start. This is the start of Santa. This is his buddy. So no, no, he won't be writing home about this. He'll just be making a little bit of a footnote, just saying this was the first of many international ODI all round of Mitch Santa. That's what we need to call him from now on. I like it. It's got a ring. It's got a ring to it. Yes. Um, the difference about the wicket was when England were batting, it looked a beautiful batting wicket. It really did, and mm. there wasn't a lot in it. So credit to England, by far the better team on the day. Ross Taylor, in fact, is out of the third one-day international, which is coming up on Saturday. So that New Zealand top six doesn't look as strong as what it did at the start of the series. And that is part of the problem with New Zealand cricket. It's a, it's a smaller scene, and there's not quite as much depth as what you see in the England team. Finding a like-for-like replacement is pretty hard when it's Kane Williamson and Ross Taylor, mm. the two backbone of the team. I missed the news. Why was Kane Williamson missing? Uh, it's got a bit of a twang. It's got a bit of an injury twang. going on at the moment. Okay. All right. Fair news. That's all right. I'm, I'm not going to. You're not a doctor, so I'm not going to let you delve into any more detail about what part of the body that twang is on or anything. <laughs> um, I just want to ask something as well here. I know New Zealand's a small country, but do you know all the international players personally? Uh, no. No. So, so how come it, it's well, maybe Chapel? I'll let you go with that one. But Guppy. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, first Mitch name Santo, terms, bro. Mitchy, Mitchy Santo, whatever it was you called him. It's like, what's going on here, Guppy? <laughs> Guppy, Guppy. <laughs> it took expecting... me a minute, I thought he was talking about a fish. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in New Zealand too long, mate. Everyone's got a nickname you, now. You all know each other. Jeez. 
Um, staying with the uh, this ODI series, Mark Wood. Mark, Mark Wood, what's going on, brother? Um, more injury news for him. Um, obviously, this man, he has a history of ankle injuries. Um, he's had a scan this week after reporting soreness. Um, although he was, he was able to train ahead of the second ODI, he wasn't selected again uh, for this game. Uh, obviously, he missed the first ODI as well. Um, according to Owen Morgan, it's not a serious concern at the moment. Uh, he's picked up a soreness in the last couple of days and he wasn't worth the risk today. That was before the first ODI. We'll see how he's assessed over the next 24 hours to see whether he'll participate in the next game or we build a plan as to when he can come back. Um, after making his debut back in 2015, uh, it's just another setback in the on-off career of Mark Wood. Rob, <laughs> I know you've got a bit about this. <laughs> yeah, we, me and Mark Wood have got a lot in common, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Made out of cardboard. We are both made out of cardboard, backs made of glass, except his is purely around his ankle. Now, I just want to read out a few things around the injuries that he's had, okay? So he came in in 2015 and made a decent impact. Been playing well for, I think it was Durham at the time. July 2015, missed the third Ashes test. October 2015, missed the third test against Pakistan. Then he had his first ankle operation. Fast forward to April 2016, he has his second operation. September 2016, he gets a fracture and misses the tour of Bangladesh and India. October, third operation. Then we fast forward into July 2017, he's got a heel injury, misses the back end of the English summer against South Africa. October 2017, gets his test ECB contract withdrawn, misses the ashes, and now he's taking himself off to go and get a check. Things, he's 20 years, 28 years old. He should have plenty of cricket in front of him. But if you can't stay fit, and it's through no fault of his own, it's just it's an injury. These things happen. Questions have got to be asked. How much more investment time is put into Mark Wood as a cricketer? Because when I tell you his stats in international cricket, is it warranted the pain of taking him out and him never finishing a series? Now, he's got 26 test wickets, an average of 40, and 25 one-day right. wickets, at an average of 44. We spoke about this a little while ago, and I I really like Mark Wood. When you look at him, ball by ball, he looks a good bowler. He looks quick. He looks sharp. He's got an interesting run-up. I'm not going to go into that. But he looks a good cricketer. But then you actually look at his stats. I don't know, remember last summer he was playing. He doesn't take wickets at the moment. So if he's not taking wickets, what's the point? I don't really understand mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Um, and also, I've got to say, mate, what's the, what's the most important ability of a sports person? Uh, drinking beer after you? the game. What is that called? Drinking beer after the game ability. Yeah. No, best ability is availability. <laughs> Straight out the playbook. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that one, but it is. It is. I love that saying. You know, you can be the greatest player in the world, but if you're not fit and you can't get on the field and play cricket, then yeah. you're absolutely no use to anyone. Yeah. So it's it's a shame. But I, I, I like the guy, and I, I'm sure he wants to play in all formats. But maybe this is one. This is one of these individuals that maybe make, needs to make a decision over how much cricket he's going to play and what sort of cricket he's going to play in the future. Mm, definitely, it is a it is a difficult one to get your head around. I think England got so fixated with pace with the Ashes series came coming up, and we've discussed it before that people are going. We really need Mark Wood. We need someone that can bowl 140 clicks. Um, mm. With those stats. His stats are obviously going to be inflated because the guy's never fit to get a run of consistency. And his stats right. in county cricket and one-day cricket uh, normally are 28 and 31 average. Miles better. Different class at that level. He needs to be fit and he needs to go away and get himself fit. Work on it. Do so, Just put in a few yards in the gym with the physio and just put international cricket on the back burner and be able to come back stronger in a year's time rather than... Yeah, I'm back for a little bit. No, I'm not back. I'm in. I'm out. He's doing. He's doing the okey cokey, and it's all about. Yeah, <laughs> he's just going to end up on the shelf sooner rather yeah. than later. Unfortunately, I think you're spot on with that, mate. I think the big thing as well that we need to consider is England. The bowling attack for England, seam attack. Forget about spinners for now. It's at a point where it's at a, you know it could be at a crossroads very soon. Jimmy A is getting up in age. Hopefully, he can play forever. He's like Peter Pan. Stuart Broad has not played as well, but he is working hard to come back to be the player he was, and I've got a lot of confidence that he will do. After that, where are we? We've got Wokes. Wokes is a nice cricketer, um, but he, he's not going to knock someone's block off. He, he's not going to absolutely blow a team over with the ball, mm. especially not in four-day, you know, five-day cricket. Um, 
then after that, Wood's always injured. Finn, is he injured? Is he is he playing right? Is his knee knocking the bales off as he bowls the ball? You know, there's question marks around all those seamers around the side. You've got the Curran brothers. You know, Tom Curran's come in a little bit. There's a massive, massive opening for young up and coming seamers at the moment. Um, and you know, Wood, if he's not going to be fit, you've got to move on from him for the time being. You've got to look around and see who's the next guy. Is it a Jamie Porter, a Tom Helm, or somebody like that? Um, you know, who we'll talk about a little bit more when we get closer to the test series. But yeah. there's just an opportunity there at the moment, and you know, it's it's a key time. We can't, we need players that are going to be fit and starting to step up. It's the same as the top order, isn't it? You know, yeah. The openers of the test side. We need that next generation coming through and being ready to learn from these older boys. Yeah, you do. England work in four year, generally four year ish cycles. You look at the Cricket World Cup, it's a four year cycle. You're always preparing for the next World Cup. England is a test nation, same as Australia. You're preparing for the next Ashes. And I think England had put a few cards on the deck of having Woods fit for the Ashes in Australia. And I think now it's time to go, okay, what is the Ashes team going to look like the next time we play against Australia in England? Is he part of that setup? If it's a no, then there's plenty of time between now and then to be blooding through the next group of players. Yeah, absolutely, buddy. Absolutely. Right, moving on to another quick bowler, South African uh, lanky paceman, Morny Morkel. Um, he's, uh, he's announced he's set to retire from international cricket at the end of the four, four test series that's currently being played against Australia, which actually got, a, got a, away today, didn't it? So I think they're at lunch at the moment. Um, Morkel, he's 33. Uh, he's taken 529 wickets across all three formats of the international game. Um, in his announcement, he said it's an extremely tough decision, but I feel the time is right to start a new chapter. I think every player when they retire say that, don't they? Um, it's not his fault. I'll let him off. Um, he, he added that he has a young family and a foreign wife uh, and the demanding international schedule has put a lot of strain on us. I have to put them first and this decision will only benefit us going forward. Um, if he plays all four tests, I believe this will be, he'll have played 87 test matches. Um, you'd hope he'd add to the 294 test wickets uh, and if he can get up to that 300 mark or break that barrier, that would be a fantastic way to end his, uh, end his test career. Um, he's another one that suffered injuries. Uh, he had a career-threatening back injury in 2016, returned to the side in March of last year. Um, you know, he's worked his way back in there. He's, he's been a great bowler. He's big. He's a nasty sort of, sort of quick bowler. You like to watch play. Um, and at one point or another, he's been in the top 10 bowling rankings of all three formats. Um, and I believe he was uh, uh, did top the ODI rankings for a period as well, a few years back as well. So, sad news. It's great that he's said it at the start of the series so we can give him a good send-off. Um, yeah, Rob, there you go. Morning Morkel. No Morning more. Morkel. Cracking player. I would not fancy facing Morning Morkel. That bounce, that speed, yeah, it's not really my gig, to be honest. If someone can just bowl no. a nice off volley outside off stump, that will do me. Yeah, I'd be in the net. I'd be in the spinner's net. Yeah, I just need to work on my footwork against the spinners, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but interesting one, this one. There has been noise coming out that actually... One, he's, he's quitting international cricket. That's a fact. But two, there's talk of him doing a coal pack agreement and going and playing English county cricket to follow the likes of Kyle Abbott, um, Simon Harner, and there's Van Zale over there in the UK at the moment. So interesting choice that he's going, oh, I can go and play on the county circuit and earn some money. Maybe that's... We talked about the IPL last week and probably every episode we're ever going to be doing in the future. <laughs> but the, there's kind of two paths to making money. One is through T20 and the other is working on the county circuit and more and more players are going to the county circuit which is going to make the English game I think stronger it's not always about having pure 100% English players because you need something to lift the quality out of the cream at the top so I think having players like him there is going to be a, a just a superb addition to anyone that's playing around him or playing against him yeah, absolutely. I, I, I hope he, uh, he does decide to come over to County. You know, he's 33. It's an understandable uh, decision to retire from international cricket at that age. You tour a lot. You go around the world a lot. So if he can come and get a gig at a county somewhere in England and set up home over here for, for two or three years um, or a couple of years maybe, and then he can, you know, winter back in South Africa, then that sounds pretty good to me. It does. The, the one, one question with Morkel. OK, so you think of Morkel, you think of Stain, 100%. You think of Alan Donald, yep. you think of Sean Pollock. Th those... I, I, I think of Fanny de Villiers as well. <laughs> Fanny de Villiers <laughs> and Brian McMillan. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. Um, the, the, the question is, South Africa have been very blessed with having opening partnerships, seam bowlers, for years and years it seems. It was Donald and Pollock for years and then it's Morkel and Stain for years. 
question is, what is the better partnership? Is it Donald and Pollock or is it Mornay Morkel and Stain? Donald and Pollock for me. Donald and Pollock, yeah. Donald just had that just that raw pace, didn't he? And he's a nasty bugger. Um, and Pollock was just there. He was he was Glenn McGraw basically, wasn't he, for South Africa? Him yeah. and McGraw were very very similar bowlers. They were just on the on the spot. Yeah, uh, a bit like me when I rock up to Nets finally, uh, which I haven't done yet. You know that first ball, it's just on the spot, buddy. It's just yeah. on the spot. So, stick, stick a dime you know. down, I let it, bro. Yeah, exactly, exactly. If Sean Pollock comes up again, I'm going to have to dig out an old story. Um, I, I forget, but it's a great story of. Um, Oh, he, he, what's the analyst called Simon Hughes in one of his books I think it's like yakking all over the world or something he talks about um, going over to, uh, to South Africa touring and there's a young lad in the nets actually I'll, I'll remember it and tell you now um, young lad in the nets and he's going over to him and he's, he's nipping the ball away nicely and Simon Hughes is saying no you want to be able to work on changing your action a bit so you can bring the ball back in a little bit <laughs> um, and uh, I think it, it's Sean Pollock's dad's Graham Pollock isn't it the old uh, international presser legend you know he came across and was like no my boy's all right actually um yeah and that young lad in the nets was, was sean pollock so good job he, he didn't uh, listen to uh, to simon hughes now if that was england we'd have tried to change his action yeah exactly it's not the mcc manual <laughs> so. anyway staying with the south africans hashin amla uh he's signed on for the first three months of the english county season joining hampshire uh, according to Hampshire's press release, the 34-year-old has represented South Africa in 320 matches uh, since making his debut way back when in 2004. He's amassed more than 16,000 runs in ODIs and test matches combined at an average of almost 50. Um, Amler, you could probably call him a county journeyman. He's had stints now at Essex, Knox, Surrey and Derbyshire. So this will be his fifth county. Great signing. Yeah, doesn't get any better than that, does it? One of the finest players of the last 10 years. One of the most consistent. Terrible in his first couple of test matches. Wondered why the hell is he in the team? Well, 113 <laughs> test matches later and almost 9,000 test match runs. He's one of the, the greatest players South Africa's ever produced as a batsman. So, fair play to him for going into county cricket again. And again, we keep saying it. The signings in county cricket this year are bloody phenomenal. And there's some exceptional talent going over there. So, if you can get to a game, get yourself to a game and watch some of these pros do it. Absolutely, buddy. Absolutely. And it doesn't end there. It does not end there. Again, South Africa, Aidan Markham, up and coming uh, young opener. He's signed with Durham for the first month of the season. Uh, he's a 23 year old and he's going to stay over until mid May when a Kiwi wicketkeeper batsman Tom Latham will arrive to take over um, as overseas player. Uh, Markram, um, he'll no doubt benefit from his stint in the county game, um, especially when it's going to be a real testing time early season with that uh, red ball swinging around, hooping around. Um, Latham, he played for Durham last year a little bit, uh, scored 482 runs at almost 64 in four championship appearances. Um, he's also going to skip for Durham for the Royal London One Day Cup competition when he arrives. Um, Durham still have an overseas vacancy for the T20 Blast, um, so there should be a little bit more news from the North East soon. Hmm. Rob, what are your thoughts on those? I think Markham's a cracking signing. He looks uh, yeah, a genuine is. test cricketer. He looks solid. A little bit more work mm -hmm. to do around the edges, get that consistency yeah. going. But England would snap off these stats. So the guy's played six test matches. He's already registered 200s and 250s. Now, England are constantly looking for someone that can come in and average 40 in test mm. cricket. And this guy's getting in there six test matches down, averaging 52. Great signing. Not so great in the one-day game, but first-class test match. He's off to a great start. And Tommy Latham... There we go, we're on first name terms again. Oh, Latho. Latho, Latho. Um, again, solid. We've, we've talked about his coming of age in India as a one-day cricketer and just how well he's mm. been doing. He's adapted himself to all formats of the game, did well for Durham last year, possibly, possibly being blooded for a future Black Caps captaincy. So great to see mm. him getting some captaincy over in England. Nice, heard it here first. So that wraps up a few signings. Now, one other move we've had this week in county cricket. Um, young seaman Reese Topley, you may know that name. Uh, he's only a 24-year-old, but he's just announced he, uh, that he's going to be just signing a white ball contract for Hampshire for the upcoming season. Now, on the face of it, this sounded like, oh no, not another one. Here we go. This is the this is it. This is where it starts. You know, 
Um, obviously, Hales Rashid already done it. We spoke about that at length, and I apologise for how much at length I spoke about it last week. Um, but yeah, Reese Toppy, he plays for Hampshire, so he's going to be a teammate of, Ham- of Ambler. He had a stress fracture in his back last season. He also missed most of 2016. He's only played three first-class games for Hampshire since he's moved from Essex. So injuries have been a, a big, big part of, uh, of his, uh, his life the last couple of years. Um, Topley has said that it's been a real frustrating time for me as a young bowler. Uh, it is hope, though, that this proposal will assist me by preventing further injuries as my body matures. Uh, going forward, I do hope to return to red ball cricket and still harbour ambitions of being the first left-arm fast bowler to take 100 test weeks for England. But that remains a long-term goal. So, as I say, initial reaction for me was, oh, not another one. But this actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, you know, no sign of mass migration to the white ball just yet. Rashid, we've spoken about it at length. It's understandable. I don't really mind about that one. Topley, completely understandable. Hales, not going to go into it. But yeah, <laughs> I think it's a sensible move from Topley, Rob. Yeah, great shout, actually. Um, he's only played five first-class games in the last two years. So there's massive, massive issues going on there. He had a back injury and hand injury. Um, short-term goals, yep, go play T20 and one-day international cricket. One-day international, that'd be nice if he was to that level and we could get him in the team. But go and play white ball cricket, less stress on the body, and hopefully he comes out stronger at the end of it. You can remember with the England team a few years ago, they went and took Stuart Broad out a few series. And they said, no, nah, mm. you're not going to make it through. We need to take you off. We need to go and do strength and conditioning, work on your action, get you fit and ready to go for the longevity of the game. And hopefully Reese Topley is going to be another exponent of that. Yeah, absolutely, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. Big, tall bowler. He was really impressive. And he's one of those names where he seems to have vanished. And when I saw this story, I was thinking, oh, God, he must be cracking on a bit now. But he's actually just 24. So, you know, he's hopefully someone that's going to come back stronger. Uh, like you said about uh, Mark Wood, you know, go and play some club uh, county cricket, get stronger, get fitter, look after your body, and then come come again, you know, come again the next summer. So, yeah, we'll have to see. We'll monitor his progress. Um Moving away from county cricket, but staying with domestic cricket, uh, New Zealand, the Plunkett Shield, the brilliantly named Plunkett Shield. Uh, we mentioned it last week. Um, apparently, it's, according to you, Rob, it's uh, back, due to get back underway this week at the mid-season point. Um, Stuart Meeker, we mentioned last week as well. Uh, the Englishman, he'll, he's going to be finishing up the season playing for Auckland. Uh, but one standout performer from the first five games of the season has been Jesse Ryder. Um, everybody's favourite Kiwi cricketer, Jesse Ryder. Um, he scored 469 runs at 117 so far. That's amazing. Um, he's had a hit and miss international career so far, Rob. Um, question is, has he done enough to earn a call up if uh, if uh, things don't go well for the Black Caps against England? <laughs> There's a lot of water gone under the bridge with Jesse Ryder and New Zealand cricket, <laughs> in my opinion. Now, yeah. just to give you a bit of context about what's gone on in Jesse Ryder's life, so. In 2007-2018, he badly cut his, um, his left hand trying to break a toilet door at 5.30 in the morning in Christchurch after a one-day international between New Zealand and England, which meant Standard. he missed the next one-day international. So he, there's a little bit of issues going on. And the other one, the other big story is back in, I think it was 2014, he got in a bit of a scrap, it sounds, in a bar and then going into a car park where he actually ended up in a coma. Um, and a, I think he had a collapsed lung as well. So it took him a while to come back from that. There were charges against the guys who, who did the attack on him. But his record in cricket at the top level is pretty solid. It's pretty solid. He averages 40 with 1,300 runs in test cricket. Um, 33 average in one-day cricket, plus a few wickets thrown in, and 22 in T20 International. So they're not the best stats in the world. But the one thing about Jesse Ryder was he kind of played that middle-order role a little bit, sometimes bad at three, but he was impactful. He was part of this amazing partnership with Corey Anderson once, where Corey Anderson set the one-day international record for quickest 100 ever, 36 or 37 balls. And Jesse, he's, a, he's an impact player. Wherever he's gone, outside of international cricket he's gone away and scored heaps and heaps of runs um he he has gone on record as saying he's got a bit of a drink problem and they've done a bit of work previously to try and Mm. get him on the straight and narrow and get him focused in purely on cricket and not getting the whole outside of cricket influence going on in his life i don't know whether he will make it back into the team if 
I don't know if it'll be this summer. There's no talk of it in the papers out here or reading on any of the internet sites that he will make it back into the Black Caps team this season. But you never know if Kane Williamson now, if Ross Taylor's out, come the start of the England Test matches. You just never know. If the guy's scoring that much runs, who knows? But the other way to look at it is go, Kevin Peterson scored a lot of runs. He's still got axed by the England team. So it's it's the balance of no one really knows what goes on behind closed doors. Is it he's too much of a disruptive influence or has he got himself on the straight end now and the Black Caps are going to welcome him back with open, open arms? Yeah, he's another one of them guys. He's got all the talent in the world, natural talent as well, effortless talent, isn't it? When you see him batting, he, he just looks a player. But he, he's obviously had his demons. He's obviously had his issues off the field, which has affected his, his ability to, to perform at the top level and consistently do that. Um, he's 33 now. Um, so he could be one of those where, you know, is he is he worth the punt? Is it worth the hassle? But in the one day series, especially, you know, he, there wasn't anyone better for a little while. You know, he just on talent alone and, and the threat that he uh, he offered. So it's an interesting one. It's great to see him do well. Um, hopefully, he's got himself you know on the right track off the field. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see. There's nothing else we can do, is there? Really, we hope he continues scoring runs, and we'll see if he can get a call up. And if not. Let's hope he just uh, he just carries on playing well and enjoying the game. Yeah, one hundred percent. The latest statement that I found on the on the internet is that New Zealand cricket said that Ryder had not satisfied the selectors that he had settled his off the field issues and got them under control to warrant selection. Now that was a few years ago, but you just never know what conversations have gone on in the background. It's fluid, isn't it? Yeah, who, who knows? Who knows with that one? But all the best to him. That's all we can say. Um, Moving on, we're going to go jump over to Test Cricket. This morning, uh, I mentioned earlier, South Africa, Australia, the first test got underway. Um, just just have a quick look at the sides, really. Australia have gone with the same side as the uh, Ashes, um, so they're going to be strong. Um, South Africa, I'll just rattle through their team if you want, Rob. Elgar, Markram, who we spoke about, Amler, De Villiers, Duplessis, De Kock, De Bruyne, Philander, Maharaj, Rabada and Morkel. A uh, quick reminder of Australia, Bancroft, Warner, Kawaja, Smith, Sean Marsh, Mitch Marsh, Tim Payne, the keeper, Mitch Stark, uh, Cummins, Hazelwood and Lyon. Um, Australia won the toss and decides over bat. Um, thoughts about this one, Rob? I mean, I, I think it's going to be a good series and it's going to be a close one. I've seen a few people talking about Maharaj potentially being the key to this game. So, uh, but yeah, what, how do you reckon this one, one's going to go? It's a biggie. It's a, it's a massive game. Whenever South Africa and Australia used to play, when Australia were top of the game, it was one of the few times the Aussies were really, really tested. And South Africa currently second in the world rankings. Quite a long way above Australia because Australia dropped off the pace so much. But the Aussies will be confident. They've not made one change to that starting eleven from the team that troused England. So they know who their best team is and they're sticking with the young lads. But the interesting one is the score actually at the moment when we record this is 95 for 3. And Cameron Bancroft has failed again. After a okay. fairly average Ashes series, so maybe there could be some changes at the top of the order there. I think if if South Africa are to win this, their bowlers need to fire. And it's going to be Mornay Morkel and Philander, I see as the two key bowlers to be able to make an impact at the top of the order. Because somehow, some way, they've got, get, got to get rid of Smith and Warner. That is a yeah. massive task and they need to make him roads early. Exactly, that's it. You can chip away and you can get your, your Kawajas and your Bancrofts and your Sean Marshes and all the rest of it. But you've got to get through uh, through Smith and um, and Warner, haven't you? Absolutely right, buddy. Um, Rabada, Kagisa Rabada, he's my he's my one to, to kind of keep an eye on for this one. Obviously, he's, he's no no secret in world cricket, but I just think he's going to have a good series. Uh, and equally, the South African batsmen, they've got to offer a threat to, you know, or, or to diminish that threat, should I say, for the Australian quicks. Um, and Nathan Lyon as well, who shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be forgotten. Um, and it's, it's brilliant for Australia though to be able to keep being able to field these the first choice seamers. For too long they've had too many injuries. They've not been able to have a Cummins in the team or a Josh Hazelwood. So it's really good. I think the only only kind of seamer that's struggling at the moment is James Pattinson. Um, I forgot that name. Just James. Yeah, Darren's the older one, isn't it? The, 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 the England player. Darren. <laughs> He was great for knots. But yeah, James Pattinson, who was equally great for knots last year, um, he's the only one that's really still struggling. So it's so good to see them keeping those guys fit. And when they are fit, they're a hell of a team. Mm, they definitely are. The one thing it'll be interesting to keep an eye on is going to be the scoring. So 
South Africa beat India in a very, very evenly contested series where no one really got going. There was only one or two big scores from Virat Kohli. Uh, I think uh, De Villiers got a score. Algar gritted it out. But it was all low scoring. And the, the key point to every single game was the bowlers in the fourth innings of the match. Bowling in the fourth innings, that team always capitulated. Now, Australia are going to have that. Australia are going to be bowling last. Um, so if they can score 300, 350, that's, that's probably going to be enough to get them get them or give them a chance of, of victory. But it's not going to be your 500, 600 run sort of series. No, these are two evenly matched teams. 350 is going to be a lot of runs. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see how the pitches look and how they play after the, uh, the debacle with the, uh, the India series. So, um, linking that on nicely, I, I didn't just crowbar the India series in there because I could do this, but um, India have announced their squad for the uh, upcoming Nidahas Trophy, which is going to be played in Sri Lanka starting March 6th. Sounds like uh, a, a good tri- segue, series. Rich. A good segue. A good one. It was, uh, yeah, let's just, let's just say it was intentional. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, not, it's in Sri Lanka. They're going to be playing in Colombo, uh, the Prima Data Stadium in Colombo, and it's going to be a tri-series between India, Sri Lanka, and neighbours Bangladesh. Um, Captain Virat Kohli, MS Dhoni, Bhuvaneshwar Kumar, again, nailed it. <laughs> Current joint number one T20 bowler Jasprit Bumar, as well as Leggy Yadav and all-rounder Hardik Pandya have been rested. Um, Rohit Sharma is going to captain the 15-man squad with Sikha Darwin acting as vice. Uh, so into the squad comes Rishabh Pant, Vijay Shankar, Washington Sundar. Washington, what a great first name. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, Deepak Huda and Mohammed Siraj. Uh, okay, so England's India squad is a little bit inexperienced. It's obviously resting the big boys. The one I'm really looking forward to seeing is Rishabh Pant. He's the newcomer. He got the big money move, if you remember, in the IPL signing. I think mm. he was like the second biggest, or, or the I think after Virat Kohli, wasn't he? He was like the next biggest. Um, his call-up comes on the back of a really successful domestic campaign that's for him top scoring in the Syed Mushtaq Ali T20 tournament. And he's also hit the second fastest T20 100, 32 balls. 32 balls against Himachal Pradesh in the 50-over VJ Hazari Trophy. So this boy is uh, he's about to take off, basically. He's about to go to the moon, isn't he? So... I'm really interested to see how he, he performs and it gives an opportunity to some of these young blokes that we had never heard of before. Why the hell not? You, you look at it on paper and you go, oh, Sri Lanka's a really good one-day team. They're actually down in 8th and ninth, and Bangladesh are about 11th and they've just had Afghanistan overtake them in, in the T20 <laughs> ranking. So if India are ever going to give a chance to the boys to have a run out, it's, this has got to be it. I, I am excited and it's not just because of his name. I want to see Washington Sundar play. <laughs> it's a good one, isn't it? It's a good one. We need a little Hall of Fame of names. We do. We do. He's, he's Our favourite name. He's up there. Washington. <laughs> Washington. It's a beautiful I do like name. It. I do like it. We, I should just mention here, be a responsible podcast uh, presenter here. Rob, my colleague, my co-host, supports Washington Redskins, uh, otherwise known as the Washington Racists. So that's probably why he loves the name so much. <laughs> But anyway, moving on, moving on quickly, sticking with the white ball. It's worth mentioning, Rob just made mention of Afghanistan and how well they've done recently in white ball cricket. Um, the latest rankings have come out, and I want to just speak about this briefly. Um, the number one bowler in both ODIs and T20 is now 19-year-old Rashid Khan of Afghanistan. I think that is incredible. I think that's one of the best pieces of news I've heard for a long time. And the fact that Afghanistan are doing so well is just incredible, Rob. <laughs> yeah. It's, I look at this guy, right? I'm looking at a photo of him as we record this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he's probably about 27, 28. He's 19 years old and he's top of the T20 and one day international rankings. 86 wickets at an average of 13 in one day internationals. Like... That's club cricket stats. You get the one bowler from one end who bowls 20 overs and gets five wickets every week. He is that guy. And 47 wickets at an average of 13 in T20 internationals. He is on an absolute different level to anything that's ever played international cricket again at the moment. Now, Afghanistan, test status, one day international status. Expect those figures to change and him really get tested at the top level. But whoever he's being put up against at the moment... The last ones were Zimbabwe. He's um he's done incredible, and he's gone for he's gone for decent money in the IPL over the years. He went for six hundred 
US dollars back in 2017. It's to me this this sort of thing doesn't happen. You know, the number one test bowler in the world is uh, oh, it's an Australian or it's an Englishman every so yeah. often or a South yeah. African. The fact it's someone from what's been an associate nation for so long is just out mm-hmm. of this world. Look, if he was uh, Indian, if he was Sri Lankan, if he was English, if he was Australian, if he was anything else, we'd all be talking about him. We'd all be absolutely going, just going mad for this guy. Also, talking about his age, at 19 and 153 days, he's the youngest ever number one in men's ranking history. So that's just some context there for it as well. He, he's done it with an Afghanistan, Afghanistan team. With you know, he's only a young bloke. It's just, I, I think it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic achievement for him, and, and long may it continue. It is, and you talk about the world at your feet. You see it with footballers who are young lads and they've got all this money, right? He's 19 years old. This IPL, he went for 1.4 million dollars. Million dollars. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Fair play to him. I hope he goes and spends it. <laughs> so, exactly. um, just while we're on the rankings, it's worth just talking about on the bowling side of it. ODI, uh, obviously Khan at one. He's joint cut one with Jasprit Bumrah of India at number one, who is a really exciting bowler, someone I really, uh, really enjoy watching. Um, Kiwi Trent Bolt at three, Josh Hazelwood at four, and Hassan Ali of Pakistan at five in the bowling. Um, ODI batting, Virat Kohli, surprise, surprise at number one. Um, De Villiers at two, David Warner at three, Babar Azam at fourth, Pakistan, and England's Joe Root. And the T20, obviously, we've mentioned uh, Khan at number one, Ish Sodi of New Zealand at two, Samuel Badri of West Indies at three, Imad, Im, uh, sorry, Imad Wazim at Pakistan at four, and uh, Bumra again gets in there at five. On the batting, Colin Munro, Kiwi Colin Munro, jumps back up to number one, your mate Glenn Maxwell at two, Babar Azam again, he's in the rankings there at three. Aaron Finch and Guppy. Oh, Guppo. Got to look till at five. Uh, and... Two things. Glenn Maxwell, one. I'm not you, mate. And uh, two, great <laughs> to see two black caps in the top five. The great thing about one day in T20 cricket is you do sometimes see some different names popping up, especially in the T20 arena. Um, yeah. So, yeah, some interesting names there. Coley, number one in one day internationals and Davilius, two. Warner, three. Route five are the four better players of one day cricket in the last five years than them? Probably not. Mm, no, it's hey, it's all good. It's all interesting, buddy. It's all interesting. So, anything more on that, or are you happy happy with what we've got there on the rankings? I'm happy with what we've got. Virat Kohli is probably showing that he is head and shoulders above anything else okay. in world cricket across all three formats. Number six in T20s, one in ODIs. And I've not checked, but I'm going to say he's probably number one in test matches as well. He's just a phenomenal talent. Yeah, he's head, shoulders, and on a step ladder above everyone at the moment, isn't he? Mm. Yeah. Cool. Okay, right. Just moving on. It, it feels like this, this pod this week is just just lots of different news points. And, and I think it's probably just worth noting. The, the, there isn't really that big discussion point this week that we, we thought we could get a teeth into, like the white ball stuff last week. So so there's just we're just picking up with some bits of news, aren't we, this week? Just running through it. Um, and we'll see where we are next week. But uh, so carrying on, England, uh, a bit of news, not involving their ODI at the moment, but involving the Test side. Um, Liam Livingston, he's 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 been a relatively recent call up. He's he's been away with the England Lions in West Indies at the moment. He's actually flying back to England because of an ankle injury. Um, he's going to receive treatment. It's hoped he'll be fit to join up the Test squad in advance of the first Test. Uh, but if not, England are going to be, I don't know quite where England are going to be going, because I would imagine Livingston would have come into the team to replace James Vince. Um, so if Livingston isn't fit, is it Vince? Or suddenly we have a big question mark over who the next player would have been. I would just like to throw it out there that I think Alex Hales may have been the next person called up if Livingston was injured. Hales would have been a cracking call. I may <laughs> well have been start. handing in my white England shirt if England went and called up Gary Balance to bat at three. Oh my word! Please don't do that. I, I'm, I refuse. I, no, I'm not going to say what I was going to say, but I would really rather not see an England side with Gary Balance in again. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. batting at three. It just oh, it, it doesn't work. Shudders. If Livingston does miss it, I'll be really gutted for the guy. Young lad, 24 years old. Will yep. get his feet. He's scoring first-class runs for fun, averaging 45, um, over 2,000 runs. No scars from playing against the Aussies. He can come in and he's got a fresh run. He's got a couple of test matches here, and then he can start to get ready for the English summer. So he'll put himself in a great position just to have a couple of tests here. If this isn't his chance, he will get one 
down the line. It would be interesting to see if they called up James Vince back into the squad to back at three or they went with someone completely different. Yeah, I think Vince is in the squad, but it's whether or not I don't think he'd have been in the eleven. Uh, I think that's where it is. I think he'd be a drinks boy. Uh, but yeah, it will be interesting to see how they make their decision. The, the, the selection recently for England is absolutely no idea. So nobody knows, do they? So um, just staying with uh, the Lions, where the, you know where Liam Livingston has been playing, um, they're on the verge of an absolute three nil drubbing uh, in the unofficial Test series against West Indies A. Um, they lost the first Test by two wickets in a back and forth game, and then they were they were just hammered in the second test, getting beat by an innings in 17 runs. Um, the, the third and final test before some ODIs is being played at the moment. Uh, that should be wrapped up in the next day or so, and it looks like West Indies A are going to win that one pretty comfortably as well. Um, we'll look back on this and the notable, or should I say not so notable, performances next week to link it in, up with the upcoming New Zealand-England test series. Um, just It should just be mentioned, though, we're talking about batsmen if Livingston is not fit. Nobody, and I mean nobody in this England Lions side, has done anything to suggest that they should be the next man to be called up. Um, it's been pretty ordinary. Uh, West Indies, though, credit to them. They've got two, two bowlers in particular who have pretty much taken all the wickets. <laughs> so, But we'll talk about that next week. Yeah, interesting. That England Lions is a real great opportunity for any cricketer to get the tee stuck in. Peterson did it. He went to Zimbabwe, scored a stack of runs with the England Lions. Heaps of players come through it. So to see them failing against a West Indies team, and West Indies, historically, for the last 15 years, have been pretty Billy Joe average. So, yeah, <laughs> a bit of a job to do for the English Lions. If the, And it doesn't take a lot. If someone goes down injured, your next port of call is the England Lions. So they're playing for a hell of a lot. And there's some decent teams there. Yeah, look at the openers. There's Hamid and Jennings opening the batting for them. Sam Northeast is in there batting it down at five or six. There's some serious players. Someone's just got to stand up and go, hey, I'm your next man. Yeah, and nobody's done that, especially those two openers. I mean, we had high hopes for uh, Has- um, Has- 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 Habib Hassim. Oh, I forgot his name. You correct me on that one, Rob. What's his name again? Uh, Hamid. <laughs> Hamid, yeah. I'd Hassan. written him down as Habib. Yeah, that's Hasib. it. Hassib. Um, yeah. <laughs> Bless him. <laughs> um, he, he did really well when he first came to the team. His temperament was fantastic, but he's just he's lost his way. He really lost his way. And, and Keaton Jennings as well. He came in, hit a century, looked like he was going to be an answer. And he's lost his way. They're both averaging 20-odd in this series at the moment against West Indies A. So they're not doing enough. It's just simple as that. The, the, the one guy that has impressed a little bit is Paul Coughlin, the all-rounder. But I don't think we're looking at all-rounders at the minute with Stokes and Wokes and Ali. Um, so it really is those top order, top four batsmen that we're looking at. But uh, as I say, we'll, we'll chat about that a little bit more uh, in the next couple of weeks because it's... I think you know it's interesting to preview that New Zealand England Test series, but it's also for me it's going to be interesting to talk about where England are going to go as in that side because there's been too many too many changes of personnel, too many you know new selections, dropping players, picking players. So I think it's just worth talking about maybe some players that are on the radar, yeah. maybe the next ones coming through because we'll, they'll probably be playing in the next six months. <laughs> Great stuff. All right, Cricket Island. Um, they, uh, this could be their first mention. <laughs> Welcome to the world of the Leading Edge podcast, Cricket Island. Um, really exciting news for them. They've revealed plans to develop a new permanent purpose-built stadium in West Dublin. Um, the, the Cricket Board has voted to pursue the creation of, a, of a, this new national cricket stadium, a national sports campus. Um, Irish International has traditionally been staged at Malahide or Clontarf in Dublin or Stormont in Belfast or even Breedy in County Tyrone. Look at that knowledge. Um on the 22nd of June uh, of last year, Ireland and Afghanistan were awarded test status to go along with their ODI and obviously T20 status. So this shows a country and a board aligned to improving the game in their in their country. Um, Ireland's first test um, this year is in May against the Touring Pakistan side. Rob? Yeah, incre- in- incredible for the Irish. Uh, I, I don't know, it's just... Years and years ago, you started to see a few guys starting to come through. You saw Ewan Morgan and Ed Joyce. and uh, There was Porterfield and there was the little wicketkeeper. I can't remember his name. It might have been Sterling. You started to see these guys mm. coming through and starting to make a name in county cricket. And I remember at the time thinking, these guys are good enough. And Ed Joyce and Ewan Morgan made the allegiances to, to England to go and play at a high standard, which is great. But for a while, Ireland have been getting it done quietly or not so Mm. quietly, at the big tournaments. They qualified for the Cricket World Cup, the 50-over competition for the first time in 2007. But since then, 
have qualified for every single major tournament, uh, 2011, 2015. They also qualified for the 2009, 2010, 2012, 2014 T20 competition. Mm. So there's consistency, and they have for a long time been one of the top-ranked associate nations, along with maybe Holland and maybe a bit of UAE over the years. And they've picked up some scalps over the years while they've been Ooh. playing. And I don't think there's any bigger scalp than the time they beat England in the T20 World Cup. I, I, think don't, I don't remember that at all. Kevin, no, I don't remember that. Kevin O'Brien, the guy who went to play oh. on at Knott's, got a massive yeah, score and took him home. Yeah, the brothers. Was it Niall O'Brien? He was the keeper, wasn't he? That was it. Yeah, the Stern as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember that that game at all, buddy. So I'm just gonna just gonna skim past that one. <laughs> <laughs> Traumatic. So. Who was the big quick they had? Was it Boyd Rankin who played for England for a while? Boyd Rankin. Boyd Rankin. Oh. He was in the was it 2013 14 Ashes series squad where oh, we went. We need an unfit Chris Tremlett. We'll take Boyd Rankin and I think it was Stephen Finn where we just ruined his action. And it was like, we're going right. with guys that are six foot eight only. It's like the WWE, you've got to be six foot eight. And I think Boyd Dick Rankin course. fell apart on the first day with an injury. I just, I, it was such a strange period for England, wasn't it? It was like, right, you know, you're a good bowler, but sorry, mate, you're only six foot one. We need six foot eight at least. It's like, you know, were they picking for a basketball team or were they picking for an England test side or an England you know, cricket side? It was ludicrous. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I won't mention any names, but we've got a very vocal, opinionated chap who played cricket with us both, um, who uh, who wasn't a big fan of Boyd Rankin. <laughs> I think it has to be said. I think that's been really polite. And, and just talking about Ireland as well, you know, it, it is good that there hasn't been any more of their players coming to play for England in the last few years, because these, these associate members or these new young members, it's going to take them time, but they need all the players they can get. I'm really pleased Ed Joyce has, has gone back to play for Ireland. I'll be honest... I've said it for a few years, I'd have quite liked Owen Morgan to go back to Ireland because what he could do for them would be incredible. Mm. You know, to captain them in, in the white ball formats and, and really, really kick them on and give them some experience and pass that experience on that he's learned. Um, it's a shame that's, that wouldn't be able to happen or isn't going to happen. Um, but I do hope that we don't see any more Irish cricketers coming to play for England. You know, Ireland are there, they're, they're, they're standing on their own two feet now. Go and play for your, you know, your own country. And, and really, really get them to where they deserve to be. I mean, remember, it wasn't long ago when Sri Lanka first started out, you know, mm -hmm. Bangladesh first started out. So it takes a while. Uh, but yeah, I really, really hope that this, this, you know, this giving them their own home, um, giving them a real good foundation, you know, literally and, and, and figuratively, yeah, will, um, will really do some good things for Irish cricket going forward. Mm, definitely. One point on the one, the play, play, played more one day international cricket than T20 cricket, just because it's been around a little bit longer. Um, mm. Out of every associate nation they've played against, they've got a winning record. And not just Excellent. close, they've got a massive winning record. But they've Good. also beaten Zimbabwe, West Indies, Pakistan, England, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan. They've picked up, they've beaten half, pretty much half, maybe a little bit more than half of the actual test nations registered at one day cricket. So they're no joke. They They can seriously cause people problems, probably a bit more... With the with the bowling, maybe it's it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. You look at Afghanistan coming in, you're like, wow, they've got a world class spinner coming in. Uh, Bangladesh came in and they had no bowling, but they had a great batting lineup. But they could fall apart at the time against top quality pace. Um, yeah. So fair play to Ireland, yeah, guys. If you're Irish, stay in Ireland cricket, make it for this country because the world of cricket needs more than nine teams playing at a top level. The game of world cricket and the brand so of cricket. The only way it's going to grow is if it keeps developing into different countries. You look at football, it's played by 200-odd countries around the world. Everyone loves football. Cricket, nine countries at the top level. That's a problem. It's got to grow. The only way it'll grow, Afghanistan and Ireland, you guys making it at the top level in test cricket. Exactly, exactly. Can you imagine as well, it'd be nice if we could have some test series, some test tours, or some, even just some cricket tours to different countries. You know, I've been lucky enough to do a few, but it'd be so much fun, wouldn't it, to be able to do some of these other associate members. Maybe not Afghanistan just yet. I'll give that maybe a few more years. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it would just be so much fun. Can you imagine being able to do a test tour or a proper tour to like Holland or something, like a three-match oh. test series in Holland? You, you mean like when we want to, went to watch Holland play cricket in the old <laughs> Midwest Trophy and we never saw any cricket? 
Yes, I, it did make me think of that when we were talking about Ireland. So, yeah, it's probably just worth mentioning that, isn't it? I think that's quite amusing. So, one of our good friends, Chris Tall, um, he's a big Warwickshire fan. You know, we, we forgive him, so you guys can as well. Um, he decided that we should all go, go over to Holland because uh, Warwickshire were playing against Holland in Rotterdam. Is that right? Yeah, it was in Rotterdam, yeah. Rotter, Rotterdam, yeah. So, so me, Rob, Rob's brother, Paul, Craig, one of our pals, and Chris, we went over there to Amsterdam for a few days. And it wasn't the best weather. <laughs> um, so we boarded a train, went across to Rotterdam, uh, went for a cup of coffee first, where your brother decided to try and break his arm in a, uh, in a door, didn't he? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know those little spinny doors that you go through? He decided to run through it a bit too quick, and then he stuck his arm out to try and stop it like a, uh, like a, like a tailor. Oh, that um, was incredible. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so we were we were in Rotterdam and we we're just looking forward to this cricket. It's going to be fantastic. We we're going, basically going to see a domestic game of cricket, but overseas. And the weather wasn't great, so we was following the uh, the um, the news and and it didn't look like any cricket was being played. So after a few hours, we were like, oh, let's go back to Amsterdam, and you know it's not going to be played. And by the time we got back to Amsterdam, the game had started um, and it finished. So we watched it in the bar in Amsterdam instead. Yeah. So. We had five wasn't days. Wasn't the most successful tour. Five, oh, yeah. I, I think it was a very successful tour. We had five <laughs> days in Amsterdam, on the lash with the boys. It was, <laughs> it was the best week I had that year. One of the best cricket tours I've ever been on. There wasn't any cricket. Yeah, <laughs> so, incredible scenes. Yeah. So anyway, more of you guys, more of you associate members. You need to up your game and <laughs> become full members so we can come and watch cricket in your countries. Simple as that, Rob. I think that's wrapped up most of what we've got to talk about today. Next week, there'll be more cricket. Obviously, we've got Australia uh, against South Africa. We've obviously got more New Zealand against England. Uh, we should have the start of the Nidahas, or Nidahas, um, again, pronunciation. Apologies. If anyone ever wants to pick me up on any of these pronunciations, send us a little audio clip. It'd be much appreciated. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of cricket next week to talk about. But for now, I think that's pretty much it. I know you've got something you'd like to end with. Um, apparently, you've been watching some cartoons talking about Fireman Sam. I have. This, you know, you read stories and you're like, that's bloody awesome. And this was one <laughs> of them where I was like, oh, Sam is the hero next door. If anyone else can remember Fireman Sam, <laughs> just, just me, just me by myself there. Just you, Rob, just you. This is a, a great story coming out of New Zealand. The Seth Rance, who's played a couple of international games for New Zealand, on Monday this week, he's a station officer at a Greytown Fire Brigade, um, and he helped extinguish a blaze that basically threatened to engulf the White Swan Hotel, a pub near Greytown, um, in the Wairapa region of New Zealand. Now, incredibly, that, that's his job. He also plays cricket. I never knew this guy... Shane Bond, New Zealand fast bowling legend, genuine wheels, genuine class. He had a part-time job as well on the side. He was a policeman. PC Plot worked amazing. on the bill. Get out. <laughs> Just did he used to, did he used to take people down like Crocodile Dundee? You know that scene in it where he gets the tin of uh, beans or whatever and just throws it at the back of that guy's head to arrest to get it. <laughs> Do you reckon he used to have like a cricket ball in his pocket along with his handcuffs? Oh, so, oh hey, mate. Oh no, sorry, that was an Australian. Hey, oh, I can't even do a kiwi. But anyway, I bet he used to get the cricket ball and like stop, and then just throw the bowl the cricket ball at him and just knock him over. Is that is that probably what happened? I feel or am like I that could be away? a kid's cartoon, mate, and we probably should copyright it and not put it on the air before anyone else gets that idea. <laughs> Shame, bomb, the bowling policeman. <laughs> <laughs> just in incredible people with different lives as opposed to cricket. So if you guys know of anyone else that's it's kind of done a bit of an obscure job on the side of being a, a professional cricketer, make sure you let us know and we'll get it on air. But I think, Rich, that's probably going to be us for today. Yeah, I'm good with that. But yeah, I, I really would like to know about some more moonlighting cricketers. Moonlighting. Definitely. Moonlighting cricketers. So please, please let us know if there's any more stories out there that we're not aware of. I like it. Um, I just want to say a big shout out. So we actually went, uh, we went global. Is global the right word? We Ooh. went open. We've come out in terms of doing this podcast. We've spread the word on Facebook. So just a massive, massive thank you to everyone that's liked the Facebook page, subscribe to YouTube, yep. subscribe to Apple or Android, wherever you download your podcast. A massive thank you for us for taking time to do that and listening to the podcast. We're up over around 250 views in total for the podcast that we've dropped all four episodes so far. So things are growing 
and going in the right direction nicely. Production's going to keep going up. There's a website in the mix that we want to keep growing this cricket community. So just a, a thank you for the continued support from myself. And that will be it for today. So it's goodbye from me. And yeah, it's goodbye from me. And, and as I've said before, tell your friends, tell your family. Let's grow this thing. Awesome. Thank you very much, Rich. Thank you, guys. You've been legends. Till next time.